Welcome. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's lecture in the year-long lecture series on race and regulation organized by the Penn Program on Regulation at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm Kerry Colonisi. I'm on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and I direct the Penn Program on Regulation. This lecture series focuses on the connections between regulations and uh, the most important task for every society, ensuring equal justice, dignity, and respect to all people. Today's lecture is co-sponsored by the Penn Institute for Urban Research, as well as our partner for the entire lecture series, the University of Pennsylvania Law School's Office on Equity and Inclusion. Today's lecture, Redlined Forever, the Racist Past of Today's Land Use Regulations by Jessica Traunstein comes at a time of increasing polarization in the United States. And today's speaker will help us understand the historical roots of division in our housing and inequities and racism in our patterns of land use. Uh, these are issues with uh, certainly historical roots, but also of deep persistence and contemporary relevance. In fact, just last week, uh, US Attorney General Merrick Garland announced a new initiative at the federal level to combat discrimination in banks lending policies, stating that uh, he was committing to, quote, ending uh, modern day redlining. Uh, after the conclusion of the lecture today, we should have uh, an opportunity for questions from the audience. And to submit your question, uh, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I will be able to see your questions and be able to ask them of Professor Traunstein and will do my very best to try to get to all of uh, the questions uh, that we can in the, in the time that's allotted. Uh, Professor Traunstein is uh, the Foundation Board of Trustees Presidential Chair of Political Science at the University of California, Merced. Uh, before then, she was on the faculty at Princeton University. She's the author of two award-winning books, uh, Political Monopolies in American Cities, The Rise and Fall of Bosses and Reformers, published by the University of Chicago Press, and the book most closely related to her talk today, uh, Segregation by Design, Local Politics and Inequality in American Cities, published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, her research is uh, wide ranging in its sophisticated use of multiple research methodologies from historical analysis to case studies, experiments, and large and quantitative research as well. And she has uh, a, a record of getting involved in the world itself as a consultant to the US Department of Justice, to city governments and various community organizations. We're very pleased to have Jessica Traunstein here today to talk with us. Uh, thank you very much, Jessica. We're looking forward to your lecture. Thank you so much, Carrie. I'm gonna share my screen. As Carrie mentioned, this uh, talk is entitled Redlined Forever, the Racist Past of America's Land Use Regulations. The talk today is going to draw on my book, Segregation by Design, as well as a new paper that I have uh, that has this same title, Redlined Forever. Segregation by Design is a book about the ways in which race and class segregation become institutionalized and what the po political consequences of segregation are. We know that the quality of services that any person experiences in the United States is largely a function of the neighborhood in which a person resides. When poor people and people of color are concentrated in residential locations apart from wealthier people and apart from white residents, we say that a place is segregated. It is that segregation that permits unequal access to public goods and services. This is not in dispute. 
Yet the extent of segregation varies from place to place and everywhere has changed dramatically over time. Where people of color and the poor used to be isolated in separate neighborhoods, now they're isolated in separate cities. So the book asks, how does segregation become entrenched? Why does its form change? And what are the consequences? And my answer, and I think part of the reason why I'm talking here to you today as part of the series, is the answer that the answer is the local politics of land use. I argue that white homeowners' preferences have been institutionalized through the vehicle of local public policy, shaping residential geography for more than 100 years. Conventional wisdom explains segregation along race and class lines primarily as the result of two causal factors, racial antipathy and or economic inequality. But both explanations rely on individual choices for housing that are made by residents when they're looking to live in a particular location. And the housing doesn't just magically appear. These explanations completely ignore the underlying set of choices that generated the local geographies in the first place. I argue that local housing geography is created by local policies, property owners, and those who derive their livelihood from property, seek to protect and enhance property values and control the quality of municipal services like schools. These goals are public Go public goods, their collective endeavors, the value of your house or the value of your child's education depends crucially on the value of your neighbor's house and what other children attend your child's school. Because these are public goods, the maintenance of property values and the provision of public services requires collective action for production and stability. Government plays a fundamental role in the creation of collective action. And here it is local governments that play the starring role because they alone regulate land use in this way. By invoking their powers of control over land use and making choices about service provision, local governments affect the aggregate demographic makeup of communities and the spatial distribution of residents and services thereby generating and reinforcing segregation. For more than 100 years, local policies have insulated the neighborhoods of white property owners, resulting in segregation along race and class lines. And not only is local politics a fundamental driver of segregation, but battles over the control of urban space are the primary driver of local politics. At stake, of course, is the quality of life accessible to residents and the markets available to commercial interests. And the result, I argue, has been segregation by design. Historically, race and class segregation was the result of actions in the private market because land use regulations didn't exist a, a really long time ago. And governments, local governments in particular, were small and poorly funded. Violence and vigilante activity was a very effective means of asserting and defending neighborhood color lines. But more importantly, across the United States, restrictive, government, restrictive covenants became a powerful and popular means of maintaining exclusivity. And you can see here on the screen an example of one of these restrictive covenants. A restrictive covenant is a private agreement that's written into the title, the deed of the house that you will not sell your house to certain groups. These restrictive covenants were not struck down by the Supreme Court until 1948. And so they had many, many years to work in, and become part of the fabric of our cities. As working class black migrants and foreign immigrants poured into cities to take advantage of industrialization and as cities became modern service providers in the early 1900s, white homeowner neighborhoods became threatened by encroachment. The maintenance of exclusivity required coordination and the constant vigilance against potential violators. Marshalling the power of municipal government became a clear path to creating segregation that was much stickier than the kind of segregation that existed before. 
land use regulations could offer developers and property owners the promise of a protected investment and exclusive access to local public goods. Several Southern cities established separate black and white neighborhoods in the early 1900s using zoning. And this is a map from the city of Atlanta that shows you an example of this kind of race-based zoning. The Supreme Court rules race-based zoning where you say this part of town is going to be where the white single family homes are going to go. And this part of town is going to be where the apartments that serve people of color are going to go. The Supreme Court rules this unconstitutional in 1917. So cities have to figure out a new way to create segregation that isn't on its face about race. There are lots of different ways that cities get involved in, in land use regulation. One example is that sometimes cities would, particularly in the South where uh, public services were segregated, they would think about where they wanted the segregated community to be. Austin is a perfect example of this. Austin in the early 1900s had many black and Latino residents through, spread, spread throughout the city. But planners wanted to consolidate the Black and Latino neighborhoods. And as schools were segregated at the time, one very effective way of doing this was to close down all of the Black and Latino serving schools in other parts of town and only open the segregated Black and Latino serving schools in one section of town. And lo and behold, Black and Latino residents moved closer to these schools in order to be able to send their children to school. And Today, Austin still bears that same segregation pattern. So even without designating specific areas for the city that are to be inhabited by certain demographic groups, cities can and do generate segregation using land use regulations. They can specify lot sizes and housing density. They can put freeways and railroad tracks in certain locations. They can physically separate neighborhoods using many different kinds of strategies. The federal government, of course, has also played a role in generating policies that entrenched segregation, particularly uh, around the New Deal. There were a series of programs that were intended to spur construction um, in, the, in the housing industry and increase home ownership through the Federal Housing Administration. The Federal Housing Administration implemented a practice that we now know as redlining, where they developed a system to evaluate the risks that were associated with lending in certain neighborhoods. Areas that were racially homogenous, had high proportion of white residents, had restrictive covenants, and had single family zoning were much more likely to be graded as good investments by the Federal Housing Administration. And there's a quote here by the FHA on the screen. Uh, zoning, they argued, protected neighborhoods against declines in value or desirability by preventing the infiltration of business and industrial uses, lower class occupancy, and inharmonious racial groups. It was intended to create segregation. As the history of Atlanta that I just talked about suggests, the FHA didn't invent these standards of racial worth, but it bureaucratized them. It lent power, prestige, and the support of the federal government to the systematic practice of racial exclusion. These federal policies were in place as suburbs exploded with population in the post-World War II period. Along with the fact that race and income are highly correlated in the United States and that the FHA loans prioritized new development, this meant that early suburbs were much whiter and much wealthier than their neighboring cities. This would change, of course, over time. You can all think of a suburb that, uh, that today is inhabited by many people of color, but there remain places that are overwhelmingly white and wealthy. So where does this leave us? Well, this leaves us with two patterns of segregation in the United States, a history where neighborhoods were segregated by race and class, and more recently, where whole cities are segregated from each other by race and class. I'm gonna show you some maps to help explain this a little bit better. This is a map of Camden, New Jersey in 1940. What I want you to see here is that 
there are concentrated neighborhoods where there are a heavy population of black residents in 1940 in Camden, New Jersey. And the, the population of black residents in Camden is not equally spread out across the city, but there are many neighborhoods that are predominantly or exclusively white as well. Camden in 1940, like most large cities at the time, was a very segregated city. Now we're gonna fast forward to 1970. I've zoomed out here so that you can see Camden and its neighboring city of Cherry Hill. What I want you to see here in 1970 is that Camden has many more black residents than it, than it did in 1940. The share is much larger overall, but there remain these pockets of white neighborhoods up here in the upper corner and down here in the southern corner of Camden where there are predominantly white residents. And of course, Cherry Hill at this time was almost exclusively white. Fast forward again, to 2011. And what you see here is that all of the white neighborhoods in Camden have disappeared. Cherry Hill has become more diverse, but it is still overall much whiter than Camden is. And of course, this is the case today. So I thought you'd like to see a racial dot map of Philadelphia. You can see in this racial dot map where every dot represents a person and the different colors represent different racial groups. You can see that Philadelphia is segregated internally. There are neighborhoods that are predominantly white, predominantly Latino, predominantly black. And Philadelphia is segregated from its neighboring cities, right? There are outer lying cities around the edges of Philadelphia that are almost exclusively white. So Philadelphia, like all metropolitan areas in the United States, really helps us to see these two patterns of segregation, segregation within cities between neighborhoods and segregation across cities within the larger metropolitan area. This is where land use regulations come in and they continue to reinforce segregation. Policies like minimum lot sizes, restrictions on density, multifamily housing, growth controls, open space preservation, high fees and cumbersome review processes, all work to codify these earlier patterns of racial and economic segregation by preventing change in the housing market, even while the nation diversifies and inequality worsens. I'm gonna show you just a few more maps. Here is the Bay Area in California. This again is a racial dot map showing you two kinds of segregation. In this first map, I'm circling here the city of Menlo Park. And you can see that divided by a big freeway is East Menlo Park, which is predominantly Latino, and West Menlo Park, which is predominantly white. That's segregation within a city. Here, we can look at the border of East Palo Alto, which is its own city, and Palo Alto, which is a different city. This is segregation between cities. Segregation in this case means that East Palo Alto is home to almost all the Latino residents and Palo Alto is home to almost all of the white residents. Here is an overlay where you can see the land use differences between these cities. I'll zoom in a little bit more. East Palo Alto has these dense apartment complexes with little green space and a freeway that runs right through the city. Just south of East Palo Alto's apartment buildings lies a neighborhood in Palo Alto with no apartment buildings and lots of tree coverage, large single family homes on large lots with ample trees. The city of East Palo Alto was historically the only community open to black folks in Silicon Valley. And in recent decades, it has become home to predominantly working class Latino households. But just across the border is this city of Palo Alto that is overwhelmingly white and maintains its exclusivity through these land use regulations. In a new paper, co-authored with my graduate students, we provide evidence that exclusive communities rely on land use regulations to protect their advantages. As I mentioned previously, in the aftermath of the Great Depression, the federal government launched a series of programs to spur construction and development in the home building industry. 
One of these programs was the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which refinanced mortgages that had gone into foreclosure. As part of their program, Polk created a set of maps that described the credit risk of different neighborhoods in many metro areas in the United States. Our analysis uses these homeowners loan corporation maps to provide a historical snapshot of exclusivity. So we can look and see where in the 1940s were the neighborhoods that were overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly wealthy. We match those neighborhoods, those boundaries with parcel level information, that is plot level information from all 1.5 million parcels in the Bay Area of California to try to understand how does Hulk's historical designation of a place, whether it was redlined or greenlined, affect the land use regulations that exist today. And what we find is that neighborhoods with the lowest rating from Hulk are more likely to be zoned non-residential, they're more likely to be zoned high density and more likely to be zoned multifamily today. We also show that land use regulations are associated with demographics at the census block group level. Higher zone density and multifamily designations are associated with much more diversity, fewer white residents, more renters, and more residents living below the poverty line. These regulations are also associated with more building permits meaning they're likely to be the site of new development, which all suggest that these segregation patterns are going to continue to replicate in the future. Finally, we find that these neighborhoods are much less likely to have representation on city planning commissions. So again, they're very unlikely to affect change in their community's land use going forward. Segregation creates inequalities between race and class groups because in a world of scarce resources, the politically powerful deny public goods to those who are politically weak. Segregation has meant that the benefits experienced by racial and ethnic minorities and low income individuals are inferior to the benefits that are experienced by whites and wealthy residents in the United States. Where segregation persists, we see vast inequalities in everything from schools to safe streets to drinking water. The situation is not immutable, but it is difficult to address. The first step toward policy solutions is to recognize really and truly in our heart of hearts to understand that segregation is not an accident. Segregation is purposeful. The geography of our communities did not happen accidentally. And the people who create segregation, maintain segregation and benefit from segregation are always those who are the most opposed to undoing it. But undoing it is possible. One of the most important policy levers that we have is to integrate our housing stock and to prevent exclusive neighborhoods and exclusive cities from remaining off limits to lower income families and families of color. Lower income residents could be given housing subsidies also to increase their integration into communities. Breaching segregation proves unworkable. More can be done by state governments to spread and redistribute public goods, just as many states have done with school funding. But garnering state support for either desegregation or redistribution of public goods will, will require tremendous political pressure from marginalized groups and their allies, an admittedly daunting task. However, we may see some movement in both of these arenas in the near future. Advocacy groups, citizens organizations, and concerned policymakers must build coalitions in order to make a more equitable society in the future. America's future depends on their success. Thank you so much, uh, Jessica Traunstein, uh, uh, for this walk through a very disturbing but vital uh, history of land use regulation and, and its effects in terms of equality in the United States. I want to invite members of the audience who are interested to post questions in the Q&A function on Zoom, and I will uh, field as many of those questions as we're able to. Uh, so uh, find the Q&A 
button down at the bottom of your Zoom and you can enter questions there. Uh, Professor Trounstein, I wanted to start off and just ask if you could elaborate a bit on the underlying mechanisms here. I know you talked about the public good nature of a, of a community system. You didn't spend as much time talking about housing costs. Uh, how does land use planning and zoning relate to housing costs and to these, these public goods? to create the, 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 the pattern and, and the entrenched uh, segregation that you have, have so uh, you know, helpfully described here. It, in other words, what's the underlying mechanism? So it, it's actually, there, there are a variety of different important mechanisms, but the one that you highlighted is the most obvious and the most consequential, which is the value of housing and the value of land. So when cities in, engage in the land use planning process, the land use regulation process, they effectively change the price of land. They change the value of land. They can increase the value of land and they can decrease the value of land. So a very basic example would be if you zone, if your city says in this neighborhood, every house that has that is going to be built has to be built on a half acre or more, the cost of that housing is going to be much higher than housing that is built on a third of an acre or a quarter of an acre or an eighth of an acre, right? And so what that means is just by creating that regulation of having large lot zoning in a particular location, they have said the houses in this neighborhood are going to be more expensive than the houses in this other neighborhood. On the flip side, if a city makes high density zoning possible, right? If they say we can build upwards of 40 units on an acre in this particular neighborhood, the cost of each unit will be lower, more affordable to people who have lower incomes. And of course, in the United States, race and income are highly related. And so because white wealth is so much greater than the wealth of people of color, what that means is that the higher priced housing is largely going to be available to white residents as opposed to people of color. You can also, we can also talk about the ways in which cities can do things to bring down housing value. So cities do things like run a freeway through a neighborhood, or they do things like uh, put a garbage dump near a neighborhood, right? We have to have places where we put the garbage dumps. Where are they going to go? They are going to go in next to the places that are the politically the weakest in the community. And historically speaking, that has been lower income and people of color in the United States. And so there is a cyclical process here. If you've got a garbage dump in your neighborhood, nobody wants to move to that neighborhood and the value of, of the housing goes down down over time, in addition to the initial shock that's created by the government placing the garbage dump next to that neighborhood. So uh, th th there's this nexus between economics and the value of the property uh, and the housing prices and so forth. Uh, but there's also very much in, in this account also an important role for politics. You say in your book that where communities of color have had some meaningful political voice that they have actually been able to uh, counteract uh, some of these trends that you've you've described that's right so when we when communities of color or lower income communities have either had preferences that have aligned with more privileged groups or when they have gained representation on city councils, planning commissions and planning departments or at the state level, we have seen less impact of these kinds of behaviors. We have seen higher density housing being spread out throughout more of the city rather than concentrated in neighborhoods of color, right? So one of the ways that land use regulation operates is that it protects exclusivity and allows the market to function everywhere else. That is one of the ways that segregation becomes so entrenched. So yes, there's absolutely a role for politics to play. And I, I should have said in my last comments as well, Whites and people of color have different views over how much 
they're willing to pay for exclusivity. So white residents and wealthy residents are willing to pay a housing price premium on the same exact house if that house is located in a white and exclusive neighborhood. They, they're willing to pay a higher price for the exact same property relative to Black, Latino, and poorer residents. So there's, there's uh, underlying racism, there's politics, there's economics, uh, all in the mix here. And there's something else. I mean, there's, there's stability of people's living patterns. People don't like to move constantly. And that adds to the stickiness here too. Uh, are there any examples, Professor Tronstein, of success stories, uh, particularly maybe recent ones where, where we are seeing uh, you know, greater progress toward equality in housing patterns? Well, so the most um, visible move, California's making a lot of moves. I wouldn't say we're, we're, we have made any great moves yet. We're trying, we're getting there. Um, but the most visible move at the local level was made by Minneapolis, um, who the city of Minneapolis decided to, they made a, a, a statement that said that they recognized that their zoning policies had historically racist roots and they had, they upzoned the entire city. Upzoned means now more than a single family home is located on every parcel throughout Minneapolis. So they are by right, which means you can, uh, without a lot of red tape, build some red tape, always red tape, with not a lot of red tape, you can build a triplex anywhere in Minneapolis. The problem is that there's lots of pathways to blocking development. And we can see this in California from uh, in, in many different ways. So, you know, having the zoning in place in order to develop denser housing is the first step, but it's not the last step. There are lawsuits that people can file for environmental violations. People can uh, oppose the development on a whole variety of grounds, whether it has uh, you know, too high a floor area ratios or it's going to be, it's going to violate the height limit. So there are lots of pathways to blocking. So it remains to be seen whether or not Minneapolis's change to the density zoning is going to have a big effect citywide. We just won't know for at least a decade, I would say, how well that um, you know that zoning uh, law changes uh, what's what's on the ground. But mm -hmm. we do see so, and this is the the new work that I have with my graduate students. We do see a very strong connection between high density zoning and changes in the demographics of a community. So it's it's highly likely that it will result in, in that positive outcome. There are also a, a lot of examples where the cities have been sued under uh, the Fair Housing Act um, to because they because their zoning has violated or made it uh, impossible for people of color to find housing in their community, the federal government has brought lawsuits against many cities. And I have other work that shows that those lawsuits are very effective at integrating communities. They're very effective at, at increasing diversity um, in, in communities. So there are pathways, there are success stories. I want to bring this back to the notion of politics writ large, uh, again, with the notion that where there's been voice, some of these innovations and in policies and changes in policies can, uh, can be enacted. But you describe in your paper a process by which the very segregation patterns that we observe in housing are contributing to broader political polarization in the country writ large, uh, which certainly, you know, with the, the idea of red line forever, this really must entrench uh, these patterns uh, significantly. And it makes uh, issues like voting rights uh, probably really uh, a part of, gotta be part of the package for uh, unbundling and, and resisting the structural uh, discrimination. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, the 
what, one of the ways to think about sort of the consequences of segregation is to zoom out and say, how could segregation at the local level, the micro level, be affecting our larger political structure? And one of the arguments that I make is that segregation in residential patterns has been a big contributor to the increasing polarization in the United States. So as our neighborhoods have remained exclusive or remained not exclusive, uh, we have seen both because the, the politics of those places become more polarized, but then as people move, they move to places that match their politics better. So we've seen a larger, we've seen sorting of the population and we can, I can show that in places where you had exclusive white homeowner neighborhoods in the 1970s, those places are much more likely to remain politically uh, conservative today and vice versa. Places that were had high density, uh, high populations of people of color in the 1970s are much more likely to be extremely uh, polarized toward the Democratic Party today. And so this lack of integration in our housing because our politics are tied to our demographics means that we then have polarization in the broader political world at the state and federal level in addition to polarization at the local level. I mean, look at what's going on in, in school boards today, right? I mean, there's, there's this amount, the amount of sort of pol politicization bringing in these external political forces into local politics um, is only going to get more dramatic over the next couple of decades, I think. And what is the specific role of the census and the redistricting process uh, at the, at least at the national level uh, in all of this? So, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's only so much that redistricting can fix, you know, right? So if people are segregated in neighborhoods, we, we tend, when we draw district lines, we tend to have a, a belief or a, a guide that these district lines should not be like long skinny snakes with tentacles, right? That they should be compact, that we should have districts that are meaningfully geographically representative. And if you have, any sense of meaningful geographic representation in your district, either your city council district or your state legislative district or your congressional district, and you have segregation, that district line is going to essentially map onto the segregation patterns that we see at the local level. Mm -hmm. Someone asks here about the relationship between uh, segregation and climate change. Uh, there's actually a number of questions, I guess, that are, that are in the Q&A and, and really can unbundle here. One, you've already mentioned the in traditional, more traditional environmental justice issues about uh, the siting of highways and, uh, you know, landfills and other uh, uh, environmental disamenities. Um, but there's also uh, concern about uh, you know, uh, flooding and uh, other uh, places that are vulnerable to the ravages of, of climate change. Uh, and, um, you know, also, I guess, uh, you know, just more, more broadly, energy efficiency and, and the like also plays into this as well. Uh, how do you, how do we, how do you think about and, and, and sort through the connections between housing and um, the environment and climate change in particular? There's so many connections. So uh, on the one hand, as you just suggested, Carrie, the, to the extent that segregation makes it so that people of color and our lower income residents are located in communities that are apart from white and wealthy residents, Climate, as the climate worsens and as climate disasters hit the world, the places that are going to be most ravaged by those climate disasters are our poor communities of color. And I can see this here in California. I live in the Central Valley, which is a beautiful place. Right, We're right at the base of the mountains that lead up to Yosemite. It's fantastic. I can see for miles from my office window. And yet, because we're a valley and because we are quite poor in, in the Central Valley, 
some of the worst impacts of climate change really harm the valley. So when fires explode throughout the state, all of the smoke pours into the Central Valley and sits and the pollution in the Central Valley when the fires are raging is horrible. And over in the Bay Area, people don't notice, right? And so the fact that we have segregation between regions even in the United States means that the poorer places and those places that are predominantly inhabited by people of color are going to be on the front lines of climate disasters. The other way that segregation is implicated in the, in, in the conversation about the environment here is that segregation, the implementation of segregation, the maintenance of segregation makes environmental disasters worse. And this is the way, right? So if you have, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be mean to the Bay Area just a little bit more, only a little bit. The, if you have a community that is not building any housing, but is has a, a huge booming economy where you're drawing in lots of workers from lots of places, like say the San Francisco Bay Area, but there's no housing for these workers, where do they live? They live in the Central Valley and they drive for hours and hours to get to work. What that means is that the exclusivity of a place like San Francisco creates worse climate outcomes because of the pollution from driving over the mountains for hours and hours of every day, right? So there's lots of different ways that segregation is sort of part of this conversation, needs to be part of this conversation, and the undoing of segregation needs to be part of the solution. And I have found actually that one of the coalition that often speaks loudest to communities is a, com is a coalition of environmentalists with lower income residents of color who can say, look, if we stop the sprawl, if we densify our communities, if we bring people in, if we start building transit, we are going to both fix both problems. We are going to ameliorate problems with the environmental, on the environmental front and we're gonna ameliorate problems on the segregation front. Any uh, any particular examples on that front of where the coalitions that you think have been effective between environmental groups and housing advocates? You know, I think actually in California at the state level, we're getting some momentum right now with uh, the mm -hmm. state the state laws have recently changed to try to uh, make it much more difficult for cities to maintain single family housing exclusivity. And I, you mm -hmm. know, part of that coalition has been um, an environmental justice movement. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned California at the state level, and, you know, I, I guess that calls to mind that we really don't have one government, obviously, in the United States. We have, you know, tens of thousands, if you take the local communities, and then 50 states and one national government. And, and I wonder if the, the examples that you've given where the successes have occurred at the state level suggest that we really need to kind of, the, the, the politics needs to be mobilized at a level higher than the local community. And one question I, I here is, um, you know, whether, for example, if cities themselves just tried to um, zone for more multi-family multi housing, let's say here in Philadelphia, that wouldn't really change the picture of your map on the other side of City Line Avenue in the suburbs, right? Uh, is it possible that much like in other domains, we're seeing this tension between cities and states or cities and, and the outlying areas of, of the states? Absolutely, 100% of the reason why segregation is the way that it is in the United States is because of local control, right? Local control allows segregation to happen. And just as you pointed out, the cities that need to densify are not the cities that are most likely to densify, right? So Philadelphia could zone for more dense housing, but that is not who needs to densify their zoning, right? It is the cities that are across the boundary from Philadelphia that need to densify. And they don't want to densify. That's the whole point, right? <laughs> so that, that, that mm -hmm. their land use mm -hmm. is how they want it. And so the only solution, really the only solution is a state solution. There was a, a while people thought regional governments might, might be a solution here, but they're not. They're, they're always toothless and they don't ever work. And so the only solution to the local control, to reigning in local control is a state level solution. I think a federal solution is a less good solution 
largely because I think the federal government, there are, there are 50 different places, 50 different states that need different kinds of land use um, changes. And they need to address the histories of land use in their particular state. And so it, it strikes me that a one size fits all from the federal government might be very hard to enact. And there would be a lot of pushback from the states. Whereas you want state governments to be a partner in this kind of process. And the you know efforts to affirmatively further fair housing at the federal level sort of suggest to states that they need to understand segregation, they need to promote integration, but that there's no policy prescription that is nationwide. And I think that's probably for the best. Well, the, uh, the 2015 affirmatively furthering fair housing rule that was adopted at the national level really didn't you know, have uh, any any clear mandate coming from the top down, other than to try to do a robust planning process and take into account the need for uh, low cost, uh, affordable housing uh, in in the planning process. And this this wasn't even something that would happen right away. This these planning process would would unfold over time, right, and would leave a lot of flexibility and, and 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 nuance for each each city to 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 work through but even that was something that uh in the last administration was seized upon by president trump in particular and you know try to use this as a wedge issue and and characterize the the 2015 rule as requiring that uh uh, that the Fed, you know, the federal government was going in and, and intervening, invoking that same kind of resistance, or trying at least to uh, to re invoke that resistance at the uh, uh, at, at the lower levels, and to try to, I think, on, in Trump's case, uh, try to win over some suburban voters. Uh, all part of the the mix here with this political polarization. How much, there's a couple of questions in, in, that have been asked about how much of this is uh, somewhat distinctively um, American US based uh, issue. How much of this is uh, something that one sees reflected elsewhere around the world? So I, I do not study other places um, in my research. So I am not a comparative politics person. I'm right. an American politics person, but I've done a little bit of work on this. So there's it, the, the short version, the short answer is America is very distinctive. Amer the United States is distinctive it for, for three reasons. One, our historical homeownership rates have been much higher in the early 1900s, homeownership rates in the United States were much higher than they were in, say, Europe. And what that meant was that people had an investment, a, a, a personal and important investment in controlling the property that they owned, as well as the property that their children would own going forward. That interest in maintaining one's neighborhood, maintaining the property that, that the, the community that one lives in is different in the United States, partially because we have more homeowners. We did in the early 1900s. Now we're, we're sort of similar to many European countries, but a lot of these laws and a lot of the segregation, of course, was put into place in the early 1900s. And so that's when it mattered that we were very different from Europe. The second reason why the United States is very different from other places like Canada and Europe is because of this local control. So there are some countries where there is local control, as there is in the United States, on planning and land use regulation. But the United States has a particularly uh, robust local control doctrine. The third factor that interacts with the other two factors is that public goods are also locally provided in the United States. Most, many uh, countries, developed nations, control at some higher level, either like a regional level, a state level, or a, even a federal level, the provision of services like money for education, money for road building, money for snow plowing, right? At the United, in the United States, that's, that all happens at the local level. And that's why you can drive from, you know, Princeton to Trenton and go from having a lovely plowed road to having a not plowed road because it, Princeton, uh, you know, 
can pay to plow its roads and Trenton can't. And so that kind of local provision of services combined with local control over land use combined with our high homeownership rates makes the United States quite different than other developed nations on these questions. And does it, uh, can you talk a little bit more about schools in particular? Uh, you know, what, what role do they play and, and, and how, how does the financing of schools all factor into this as well? So schools play an enormously important role. And of course, cities actually don't control schools for the most part. I mean, there's a handful of districts throughout the United States where the city government controls the schools. Mm -hmm. So school governments are their own entity, right? They're a separate government entity. And yet what the city does affects what happens in the school district. So cities, not school districts, have the power to zone. So they work in combination. Homeowners, renters, people make housing choices, a, a, a huge percentage of housing choices get made based on the school that your child will attend or the school that you would like your child to attend. So the fact that schools sort of overlay all of this means that cities have a vested interest in planning and land use that allows their residents to pick the schools that they want to pick. Now, funding for schools is also locally derived. So one way that this matters is that if a, if a, if a whole city has the same school district, the different neighborhoods in the city will have access to the same school budget. But if the school district crosses city lines, there is a Philadelphia city schools, and I'm sorry, I don't know your neighboring mm -hmm. cities, the neighboring yeah. city school districts. Township schools, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, the other township schools, that they, there's no transfer of funds between those entities, right? And so over time, as cities have become more segregated across city lines rather than across neighborhoods, the inequities in school finance have gotten worse. And so some states have tried to rectify this by balancing mm -hmm. to some extent um, the amount of money they're you know, providing a baseline threshold or redistributing funds in some way. There's a lot of economics work on this that suggests that this can actually, the, the redistribution plans, depending on how they are structured, and there's uh, that, that means it depends on a lot, but depending on how school redistribution plans are structured, they can increase the uh, school performance of lower performing school districts, lower performing schools. Nonetheless, parents still have an overwhelming desire to maintain uh, uh, an educational community for their children that they view as being an appropriate educational community. And for many white and wealthy residents, that is a white and wealthy educational community. And so there's still, even if there is this redistribution, they're still going to be interested in maintaining white and wealthy exclusivity in a neighborhood so that the neighborhood school remains white and wealthy. And we have seen historically in the US a shift to private schools, right? That's right. When uh, people, what, for whatever reason, wanted to uh, exit uh, uh, from the, the public system. Yeah, that, uh, there's actually, that's yeah. really interesting that you bring that up. In the South, the school districts are much physically larger. They have a much larger geographic footprint than the school districts in the North, Midwest, and Southwest. Mm -hmm. and the reason for that is racist. It has a, a racist history, which is that school districts in the South didn't want to have to provide too many um, schools for black children. And so if they were just one huge geographic unit, they could provide 10 schools for white school children and one school for the black school children. So, but that history of having large geographies for their school districts meant that when integration was forced by the federal government, there was nowhere to move, right? We, we were just talking about moving outside of Philadelphia to access a whiter school district on the outer boundaries. You can't, you can't move far enough away, right? From in some of these, counties down in, in, mm -hmm. in the South. And so what happened was that people took their kids out and put them in private school. So we're, we're nearing our end. I've got two more questions to ask. One at the system level. If there's one policy change uh, that you could enact 
that would be the most uh, productive in un, in helping unravel this this equilibrium that we're stuck in. Uh, what would it be? If I could wave my magic wand, mm -hmm. it would be to increase yeah. the DUA, the density, the dwelling units per acre, the density of dwelling units per acre in every parcel in the United States. With some Question. protection. So the denser areas would get more dense and the, the denser everybody areas would get would stay more. as dense. Okay. But we would make sure that there is density across all parcels mm -hmm. in the United States. Mm -hmm. And then a, a num number of people wondered at a personal level, what is it that, you know, we can do as, in, as individuals, as renters or homeowners or, you know, people who are looking for, for places to rent or to buy, what can we do? Well, you can advocate that your city government build denser housing and zone for denser housing. You know, there are, you know, that there's only so much that can be that can be done in any small period of time. But, you know, local government is very accessible and getting involved in your local planning commission and your local government, it would is a great first step and not preventing dense development from coming to your neighborhood is another first step that a lot of people that a lot of communities could take. Well, we have other questions that we don't have time to get to, and I apologize for that. We have a number of people who are really eager to see your new paper. So when it's uh, available, we can certainly help get the word out about how people can get that paper. Uh, this uh, talk itself will be uh, is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube for anybody who wants to listen to it again or share it with others. And uh, lastly, uh, if you would, uh, like to visit our website, uh, penreg.org, you can see our other upcoming lectures, in fact, one next week on uh, race and uh, election regulation and voting rights, uh, which, as we've heard today, is part of the story here about our patterns of segregation and racial inequality in housing. With that, I'd like to thank all of those who have attended today. And most especially thank Professor Trounstein for this really important work that she's been doing and for taking the time to share it with us today. So thank you very much and have a good evening.